Good morning, everybody. This is Pastor Jeff Brown of New Life Church, Hammond, Indiana. And I'm glad that you're here with us. It's uh, This is for uh, our midweek Bible study on Thursdays. And uh, we're in the book of Romans, chapter 11. And just a couple days out from my wife and I's anniversary, we're celebrating 28 years together now. And uh, we're celebrating life to the fullest as best as we can. And God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. Amen. So I'm just glad that, uh, you know, God gives us a chance to proclaim the gospel to all the world. And I don't know if this is going to reach the whole world. I believe it can. And uh, God does say that his word will not return unto him void. And that is the most important thing that. The seed, the seed of the gospel, the seed of the Bible gets spread all over the place. Some on good ground, some on bad ground. And, uh, but the Lord is the one that brings the increase, and we thank God for that. Uh, have you seen an increase in your life? Have you seen souls saved? Have you seen lives changed? I hope that you have. I mean, the Word of God is uh, sharper than a two-edged sword, and it, it divides asunder the soul and the spirit so that we can hear and know what God says. Uh, Romans chapter 11. Uh, we'll see how far we can go. I might just do the whole chapter. We'll just see. Let's pray. Father God, we give you glory and honor and praise for your word. We th gang, thank you for all that you've given us materially, non-materially, physically, spiritually. Lord, uh, be with our minds that we may... Uh, think upon you and these things and to glorify you and to Lord think on things that are good and righteous and holy and, and pure and of good report and Lord we give you many many praises in Jesus name Amen well Romans chapter 11 here we go we're definitely more than halfway through the book of Romans and uh, last week we talked about how Israel rejected Christ but not all of Israel in chapter 11. So we're going to see that in this chapter here. There's always a remnant, a leftover. Uh, if you look throughout the Old Testament, anytime Israel got conquered, whether it was Judah or the Southern Kingdom or the Northern Kingdom, there was always a remnant. God will always leave a remnant on this earth to proclaim his word and to proclaim his glory and how God has kept his promises throughout the centuries and in our case that we're living in now through the decades because most of us don't live a century let alone centuries and millenniums but we see that God has kept his word over over 6,000 years God has kept his word from the beginning of creation to the from the first man and woman on the earth until now God has always kept his promises God is a consistent loving righteous and holy God we need to remember that that he's a well-rounded father of heaven he is not somebody that is just one trait and not the other so we give God glory and honor for that and we see here that there's again a remnant of even the people of Israel to this day after Christ passed away. So we say in verse 1, I say then, has God cast away his people? Paul says, and I like how he says it, certainly not. He says certainly not a lot in the book of Romans. When he asks those questions, it's a rhetorical question. No, he is not cast away his people. No, he has not ever not fulfilled a promise. He's always fulfilled his promises. There are still promises and prophecies yet to be fulfilled. But it's on God's timing and not our own. But God has cast, but it says, I say then, has God cast his people away? Certainly not. For he says this, for I also am an Israelite. Look at me. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. The smallest, one of the smallest tribes. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. And of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. We get again a little bit into uh, predestination and election and foreknowledge. 
God knows everything before it's going to happen. He knows the nature of destru uh, the destruction of nature. He knows what kind of people are and what kind of decisions we're going to make. But he still allows us to make them through his sovereignty and through his fr uh, the free will that he's given us. But he foreknew what was going to happen. He knew there were going to be Israelites left. He knew there was I was going to get saved. He knew that you were going to get saved. He knows until your dying breath whether you're going to be saved or lost. But he wants you to make that decision. He's not making that decision for you and for me. We have to make that decision. And I know it sounds like a catch-22. But he wants somebody who truly, voluntarily wants to love him and serve him and obey him and glorify him. He didn't make robots. I mean, you see what happens with robots. Of course, the word robot never existed in the Old Testament. We call it autonomous bodies, individual persons, individual people. When you make robots, you make them in mass production. Jesus didn't make anything when it came to humans or angels in mass production. He made them as individuals. So therefore, as an individual, we need to choose salvation. We need to choose serving God the Father or serving Satan. And that's go always going to be a touchy subject while we're here on this earth. The, the, the doctrine of election or predestination or foreknowledge. You know, if God knew all these bad things were going to happen, how come he didn't control them and make good things happen? To be honest with you, I'll be honest with you, I don't know God's mind. But the Bible does say that all things work together for good to those that love God and those that are called according to his purpose. He uses the evil and the wicked and the, and the tragic and, and the sad things in our lives and the violent things in our lives a lot of times for uh, our benefit. It doesn't look that way when we're in the trial, when we're in the situation. But I've lived life long enough to be on this earth that, yes, now that I see when my wife had a stroke at 30 and now she's, she'll be 49 this year. Now I see why God allowed that to happen. You know, I, I see the financial problems that we had back in the day as blessings now because it's taught us lessons. You become strong not through when, you know, it's easy, but when it's hard and when it's difficult. We don't know the grace of God as much as if we weren't great sinners. We are all great sinners. Some are greater than others. But then there's a, 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 an amount of grace that's much more for somebody who's uh, uh, committed more sins, I guess. Who's had more rejection with Christ. I mean, I got saved at 12. I didn't have much time to reject Christ, to be honest with you. And I thank God for that. I didn't have much time to be a drug addict or a sexual fiend or uh, a stealer or a, you know, a liar or a cheat at the time I got saved at 12 years old. That's not a lot of time. I mean, a lot of people don't. There's a lot of things. I mean, there are children that have been in tough situations at that age and younger. But I thank God. There's a reason I got saved at 12 instead of 50. And God was using all the things in my life, how I got raised, the, the, the situations I've gone through in life up to this point. And he will continue to use good and bad for our benefit, for, for his glory, for the kingdom of God, for souls being saved and lives being changed. Verse 2 says, God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah? How he pleads with God against Israel saying, Lord, verse 3, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars and I alone am left. Elijah was in a bad situation. He was very depressed. Because King Ahab and his wife were there. Jezebel planning to kill him, seeking him out, trying to kill him, and he ran, and he ran, and he ran in a place that God had a protected place for him. 
But then he was so depressed. He was so defeated, even though he had just had a great victory over the prophets of Baal and over Ahab and Jezebel. Ahab and Jezebel were so mad. You know, Elijah got in trouble for doing good. Elijah got in trouble for following God. And so he thought, my life's over. I, I don't think I'm done yet, but my life's over. Look at that. There's nobody left in the whole land of Israel. But we see that's not true. Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars, and I alone am left. And they seek my life. But in verse 4 it says, but what does the divine response say to him? What does God say to him? What does the divine response say to him? He says this, I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed their knee to Baal. Praise God. Amen? In this world that we live in, when homosexuality is accepted, when alternate lifestyles are accepted, when drugs and alcohol and gambling and everything are being more accepted and it's, it's no longer an absolute truth to this world today, but relative truth. God always saves a remnant. I thank God for the people I know that are still remnants of, the, of, of Christ's kingdom. that are still haunt here on this earth. I believe that they're still here on this earth to keep the earth from being judged in such a harsh way. Now we see areas, we see people's lives, we see whole nations and sometimes cities and states and countries being punished by God. And I know a lot of people are saying, well, God doesn't punish. Yes, he does. He will punish your insolence. He will punish <coughs> your acceptance of the sins that are definitely profoundly spoken against by God. You will pay. I will pay for whatever sins I have in my life. But you will pay. You and me, we may get away with it. You may get away with it the rest of your life. And you may be 80, 90, 100 years old and still living the sinful life. But you will pay. You will pay for your, for your uh, lack of knowledge of God. You will pay for refusing Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord. But there will be a remnant here on this earth. From the time... From the time that Adam and Eve were here until the end of time, when the great tribulation ends, there will always be a remnant. There will be a great remnant in heaven after tribulation ends. There's a great remnant during the tribulation that has not come. This is not your personal hell here on earth right now, even though you may be going through some difficult times. This is not your tribulation period. This is not the world tribulation period. Though there's many things that are going bad and going wrong and, and things like that, there's always a remnant that's serving God, that's honoring God, that's sharing the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ until <coughs> about three and a half years into the great tribulation when there'll be no, the Holy Spirit will be gone, God's presence will be gone, the, the church will be gone, everybody will be gone. And then there'll be three and a half years of, of horror on this earth, ending in the final battle in Armageddon. But there's always a remnant. There's always somebody in God's corner serving him without reservation. In verse 5 it says, Even so then, at that present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. To the election of grace. Amen? I'm so glad that it's by grace that we're saved through that faith, not of works. Even through election, it's by the grace of by the grace of God. It's through the grace of God. It's not <coughs> your good outweighing your bad. It's not just God arbitrarily saying, Okay, you're saved, you're lost, you're saved, you're lost. But he, know, he foreknew our decisions. Our decisions are made through the grace. Now, I got, I'll tell you, when I got saved, I got saved in Kentucky at the age of 12 at, at Forsville Baptist Church. 
at Southern Baptist Church, and I got saved by the preaching of uh, the contrast between heaven and hell, and I sure as hell didn't want to go to hell. I wanted to go to heaven. And that scares a little boy. And it should scare us as big boys, as big girls, that the, the opportunity of going to heaven or hell is real, that you only have two places to go. There's only two. There's no purgatory. There's no in-between. There's, there's no, okay, well, this or that. There are different degrees of hell. There are different degrees and, and places of heaven. But it's all by the grace of God, by His mercy, unmerited favor. By His grace. And if by grace, then it is no longer of works, praise God. I don't have to work my way into heaven. You don't have to. Dear Catholic friend, you don't have to work your way to heaven. Dear Mormon friend, you don't have to try to attain Godhood, because you'll never do it. Any, uh, any occult that's out there, there's no such thing as nirvana. There's no such thing as a utopia but heaven. There is no such thing as uh, being non-existent, like Catherine Hepburn used to say. When I'm looking forward, she said that when I look in, when I die, I'm looking forward to being nothing, going going nowhere, being nothing, doing nothing, being nothing at all. That's how I don't want to live that life. That's not how I want to live my eternity. And you will live your eternity. The Bible says so. Whether you go to heaven or hell, you will live your eternity. Eternity, what is eternity? Forever. Never ending. Eternity does not end. This life on earth will end, whether it's from the age of the day that you were conceived or until the day that you die. That is so short and so temporary to the whole scheme compared to eternity. So you need to get saved by the grace of God. Yes, I got saved because I feared hell. But it was still by the grace of God that he gave me that fear. He gave me that fear to realize, I don't want to go there. I don't want my family to go there. I don't want my friends to go there. I don't want my co-workers to go there. So it's still by grace. It isn't arbitrarily chosen. You're saved, you're lost. You still have to make a personal decision to make Jesus your Savior and your Lord. You still have to make a personal decision to have a personal relationship with Him. Just because He's Lord in my life doesn't mean He's not my friend. The Bible says that in Hebrews He was the friend of sinners. We saw how Jesus walked with the publicans and the tax collectors. We see He didn't walk with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, did He? He was smarter than they were. He was more qualified than they were. He was more holy than they were. But he walked with sinners. He walked with me when, before I was 12 years old. I got saved in August of 2020. I'm sorry. 1976. At the age of 12. By his grace. By his mercy. By his love. God is a much more loving God than he is a, what you may think as a hateful, revengeful God. God is never revengeful at all. He is holy and he's righteous and therefore he must, because of his character, take care of sin in the way that it needed, needs to be taken care of. If we were on an airplane and we were all sitting in the, in, in the airplane, and the airplane crashes, and the stewardess tells you, Come, put, your, put your vest on, do all the things that you're supposed to do on an airplane, and then when they land and they crash, there's only one way to get out of that airplane. Do you realize there's only one way to get to heaven? There's only one way to get out of the airplane? There was only one way when God flooded the earth, that Noah built an ark, that there was enough room for people as well as the animals and Noah's family. But nobody chose to go and walk through the, 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 the door of the ark and they could have. That was grace. That was grace. It was grace that Moses or that Noah preached 120 years while he was building the ark, while he was gathering, and, and the animals came to him. 
He preached for 120 years. Not one soul received Christ as their Savior. Not one soul, when that door closed, made it into the ark because they didn't believe in the grace of God for 120. Can you imagine? People lived a lot longer back then than they do now. Could you imagine living hundreds of years, living 120 years, maybe from the time you were born to the time you die, or older than, or even shorter than, all that time. I've been preaching since I, since I was 16 years old. I got ordained at 30. And I've preached a lot of sermons. But I sure probably didn't preach as many as Noah did. Do you imagine preaching 120 sermons? I have a feeling he preached every day. Get saved. Get on the ark. Help me with the ark. We'll build the ark. And you'll be saved from the flood. That was all grace. But all we think about is the time of judgment. But God gave 120 years. It was by grace that we're saved through faith. It's by grace that we receive salvation. He says again, and I'm going to read that verse again, verse 5. Even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Grace has always been grace. Grace isn't lined with works. Grace doesn't have a string attached to it. Grace is grace. Then he says, Paul says, but if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. That's a deep subject. It's so simple. But it's so deep. Your work is not your work. Because you're not saved. And that's not going to get you to heaven. It's not grace. Grace is going to get you to heaven. Grace is what we should have one towards another. Grace and mercy is what we should have towards one another. We are to judge the sin but not the sinner. Homosexuality is wrong. And if you're doing it, God loves you. But homosexuality is wrong. If you're doing something else that you know that is against God, that you know is against this word, the Bible, God's given you grace until the day you die to make the right decision. And the day that you die, if you did not make the right decision, it is no longer grace, now it's judgment. Because there, after eternity, there is no more chances to live under the grace of God, to live in His presence to live amongst the remnant of God's people. Look what happened to the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man went down to hell. Lazarus went in the, into heaven, or Abraham's bosom, as it was called then. And they were able to communicate. The first internet. They were able to communicate. There was a great gulf fixed between them. And the rich man <coughs> asked to send the poor man, Lazarus, to dip his finger in just a drop of water and put it on his tongue. The judgment came when he died. The judgment came when he died. And I'd rather be judged now than to be judged for all of eternity. I'd rather take my punishment now than when eternity rolls around because there's no chances. There's nothing left. There's no hope. There's no peace. There's no grace. There's no mercy. There's no love in hell. You think, and I've heard many people say, oh boy, hell is going to be a party when I get there and I'll be with my friends. There is no party. There is no party on hell. There's only weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth in hell. Verse 7, but what then Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it? Talking about those that are saved now. They received Christ in their heart. And the rest were blinded just as it is written. Listen. Just as it is written. God has given them a spirit of stupidity. Or stupor. <coughs> Eyes that they should not see. And ears that they should not hear. To this very day. And David says this. Let their table become a snare and a trap. 
a stumbling block and a recompense to them. A recompense means a payback. Let their eyes be darkened so they, that they do not see and bow down their backs always. What does that mean? What does that mean? Paul quotes Isaiah. And then he pro uh, talks about David. To show that Israel's spiritual indifference was a continual pattern. When you continually sin, not the sporadic stuff that happens, but when you continually sin, and you know that it's sin, and you know the punishment for that sin, and you still refuse to forget, forsake that sin, you still refuse the, the gracious gift of God of His Son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for you and for me. When you continue in that pattern, on a daily, on a weekly, a monthly, a yearly, a decade basis. Their rejection of Christ would bring untold misery on the nation and on themselves. You're not just hurting yourself when you're sinning. You're hurting a whole nation, according to what Paul says. You're hurting, you could be hurting your whole family. You could be hurting a whole church, or a whole place of work. You could be hurting them. You will be a stumbling block. I mean, don't get me wrong, Christians can be stumbling blocks too. But you're going to be, your continual pattern of sinfulness and rejection of Christ, a rejection of God, a rejection of God's Word, that continual pattern, and just enjoying your sin, or you think you are, so that to the person who has a venereal disease that enjoyed their sin. Do you think they're enjoying it now? So that the person who's an alcoholic and now they have cirrhosis of the liver or they have hepatitis A or B or C. You think they're enjoying their alcoholism now? So that to the drug addict whose arms are tracked with holes and spots and their face, the meth user and, and the people you, you think they're really enjoying that now when they're paying the consequences of their sin? And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Just like the Titanic sunk just on a small part of an iceberg and carried so many thousands of people to their watery grave. Your sin is the tip of the iceberg. Your judgment here on the earth, unless you receive Christ in your heart as your Savior and your Lord, is just the tip of the iceberg of judgment. It's just the tip of the iceberg. Yes, good people suffer too. And it's the tip of the... But the good thing about suffering is if you're suffering here on this earth, when eternity rolls around and you're a child of God and you receive Christ as your Savior and your Lord... That's the end of suffering. That's done. You're done and over with. Your iceberg has melted. And now you're in the presence of God and you're in paradise. And you're in heaven with God the Father and Jesus Christ his Son. And those that lived a righteous and, and holy life that were your friends and your family and your loved ones. And your co-workers. Or strangers. Or biblical, the biblical characters that you're going to see immediately and you're going to recognize. You're going to say, I know. Hey, Moses, how you doing, brother? How about you, Noah? It's nice to see you. Thank you for your example. Because of your word, I got saved. Because of your example that God put in his word, I got saved. Lazarus, thank you. I know you were such a poor person and everybody looked down on you and you couldn't even get the crumbs from the rich man's table. The dogs got them before you could. Thank you for your example for trusting Christ. For living that, that awful, awful life that you lived on this earth. And now look where you're at. I have a feeling he may have one of the biggest mansions in heaven. The martyrs that live for Christ that willingly say, I will not only suffer for Christ, I will die for Christ. Sometimes it's easier to die than it is to suffer, isn't it? What do we often hear people say? How do you want to die? Well, I want to die in my sleep. No suffering, no pain, no heartache. 
I want to die in my sleep. Tragically, too many people don't. My mom died of a sudden heart attack. No, she didn't suffer a whole lot, but she didn't die in her sleep. My dad, over the course of decades, especially the last five or six years of his life, and the last four or five months were very difficult months for my dad. He had to suffer. But guess what? He's a child of God, and guess what? He's not suffering no more. How God chooses for me to go is up to him. Unless I do something stupid and try to, you know, rush God and rush his plans, which is wrong. I want to save the rest of this chapter for next week. I know it's only 10 verses, but this gives you and me hope. This gives you and me hope that I'm a remnant. I'm a remnant on this earth. If you're a child of God, you're a remnant. You're a leftover. I hear often people say, well, I don't like eating leftovers when it talks about food. But you know what? The leftovers are here for a reason. I'm a leftover. And I praise God for that. Technically speaking, from my mom and dad, I was a first generation Christian. My mom and dad weren't saved when I got saved. My dad got saved right after I did at the same revival. And we got baptized together. And for the last five or six years of dad's life, he lived with most of it with me until he got married. He was a remnant. I was a remnant. I'm a remnant. My wife is a remnant. My son, my family, they're saved. They know Jesus as Savior and Lord. He's got to save you. And then, because of what he's done, I'm making him the Lord of my life. Trying to, at least. Do I do it perfectly? No. But it's easier every day sometimes. Sometimes it's harder every day, to be honest with you. Because being saved is more than being sal is salvation. God loves you. He's leaving a remnant for you, so you can see their example. You can see them, 7,000 people, other men that Elijah didn't even know about. Can you imagine that? <coughs> Elijah just got the spotlight put on him because he challenged Ahab and Jezebel. He challenged the God of Baal and won. Challenged people about their lifestyle. Challenge people about the gods that they have in their life besides Jesus Christ. The God of television. The God of sex. The God of materialism. They're all the same God. They're all Satan. They're all Satan and his demons. In the Pentecostal world, they call it the spirit of. And it is a spirit. Because the Bible says that we fight against principalities and powers that we do not see, but are there, and they're around us. They're up above, and they're all around us, and they're working for your demise and my demise. But there's a remnant of Christians. Follow that. Follow that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Be a part of remnant of God. May God give you many blessings this week. And I'll see you on next Thursday. God bless. And bye-bye.